Um, we like to say MIT is the Georgia Tech in the North, if, just in case anybody's <laughs> curious. So, don't want you to think there's a lot of ego attached to that or anything. Um, I'm thinking, Joe, you were going to help me with the lights. Okay, great, thanks. I just want to make sure, if your eyes are as old as mine, that might be a little hard to see. Um, and the reason I, I, I wanted to do slides this morning, I was greeted by a wonderful subset of the team who you just met, and they actually took me on a great tour of the, the area when I first arrived Tuesday afternoon, and I really appreciate that. And I, uh, This is my di opening disclaimer. Any really good ideas that you hear today probably came from them. Any of the crazy stuff is the, the wacko stuff that came from my mind. So I apologize in advance. And I'm going to tell you this. I do a lot of work with the Centers for Disease Control. I'm privileged to travel to a lot of the communities, of which, by the way, you are only one of 50 funded across the United States. It was a really big deal that you received this grant. 50 communities, roughly, got this funding across the country. Um, and I've visited a number of them, and I'm very impressed to see what you guys are up to already. There's some great stuff going on, and the notion that you could fill the room yesterday for a summit meeting uh, with the range of disciplines from health to planning to um, schools officials yesterday, and, and again, to have this kind of a mix of public leaders willing to take a portion of their morning uh, really says a lot about uh, your concern here about the well-being, the health of your community. So I commend that, and I, and I thank you for taking the time, so I'm going to try to make it worth your while. Uh, and, and in doing so, I'd just like to touch on, you'll notice, by the way, most of the photos are from right here, stuff that I or your team gathered in advance of my visit. Um, I want to ask us to think for a minute about a little bit of perspective. I'm gonna, you have to put up with my opening rant. I told the group yesterday, everybody has to hear the Fenton rant because it gives you, it's two seconds long and it gives you some perspective on why health is talking about this stuff. Then I'm going to just do a little bit of public health. I'll try to boil it down to just a couple of numbers and a couple of graphs, really short. But it sets the context. Think of it as the price of admission for breakfast, OK? You got to hear the public health story. The real reason is because what it does is it sets up, why are we talking about things like uh, zoning ordinances and planning policies? It gets us to an understanding of why public health has moved into this world, uh, rather than simply just telling people, eat your fruits and vegetables and get out and exercise every day, which we've been doing for 25 years and has not worked. By the way, let's be critical crystal clear about that, has not worked, just to tell people what to do. So I'm going to conclude with some recommendations that really largely came from what I've learned from you. So out of the conversations I've had with you over the last couple of days, including this summit that we had yesterday where we put people to work for the last hour and a half, two hours of the time we were there, we asked the participants, what do you think is going to really make a difference here? So having said that, here's our, my little opening perspective exercise that I'd like to invite you to join me in. Think back, if you would, to your own personal earliest fond recollection of being physically active as a youngster. So I'm asking you to play back your own memory tapes, and I'm not talking high school sports, I'm talking when you were a little kid, like the kids in the pictures here. Think back to that age, your earliest fond recollection, and then I'll take a second, turn to the person next to you and share that recollection, so I'm giving you about 25 seconds right now. Recall and share. Ready? Go. Right now. <laughs> yeah. Riding bikes, yep, a lot of that. Play baseball in a, in a park and the city came and kicked us out. So it was a kid organized game. <laughs> what did you say? Uh, Got it. Yep, yep. What did you guys say? Uh, what did you say? I was playing in the big yard at my grandma's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask you to. Uh, I, I know this is hard because it would be a far more entertaining use of your next 45 minutes just to have those conversations, wouldn't it? I, I can tell because people, whenever I do this, get very animated. They start telling the story and their arms start moving and they're acting out, climbing trees or playing baseball in the park. You said you guys actually got kicked out of the park. It was a <laughs> kid-organized game, no, no adults involved, playing in the woods or just being outside. Um, I'm going to ask a series of questions and I want you to raise your hand and, and I really want you to engage in this process for me just because there's an important point. Raise your hand if your answer is yes to the question about your recollection. How many of you recalled an activity that happened at a certain... Uh, scheduled time and place. Scheduled time and place. How many remember only being with kids of the same age and gender? So if you were a 12-year-old boy, you're only with 12-year-old boys or whatever it was. How many remember uh, an activity that required an adult to be present? Hands up if it was an adult. How, uh, how many of you? How many of you remember an activity that, that you were wearing a uniform? You had to have a uniform for. How about that there had to be an umpire or a referee present? How many recalled that? Okay. How many of you recalled an activity that uh, was with kids of different ages and different genders? Kind of whatever you could get your hands on, that's what you're out playing with. All right, and how many remember an adult not having to be present? 
How many of you uh, could not have gotten away with what you were doing if an adult had? And, <laughs> and how many of you are elected officials now that, uh, that had your hands just up? I, by the way, am one as well. I serve on my elected planning board in my town. Um, how many of you did the activity uh, involve water? So swimming in it, uh, fishing on it, uh, maybe damming up a neighborhood creek, chasing crud, anything like that? How many of you had a fort in the woods or a place that you guys kind of hung out your secret spot that you know what no adults knew? How many did a wheeled vehicle was it involved, like a bicycle or a big wheel or a skateboard or a scooter? All right. How many of you, if I was to vastly oversimplify it, now think about the term I'm going to use here, and does this apply to you? How many of you believe to some degree you were a kind of a free-range kid, a free-range kid? Got kicked out on a Saturday morning and told not to come back till dinner time, <laughs> in my case. My mother's, I'm not making that up. So, the two questions that I'm going to ask now are really the story of the day. How many of you believe the majority of children today, over 50% of kids today in America, are free-range kids? That's interesting. And the last question is this. How many of you believe it's probably good for their health that they're not free-range, that we're fighting the childhood obesity epidemic Dr. Mara just talked about by not having free-range kids? Good thing they're not. So think about what we've just said. As recently as just a generation or two ago, we are not that old in this room. Well, I am, but the average age of the women in the room, obviously, is 29. And, <laughs> and even at that, we had free-range kids then, and we don't now. It's not that long an elapsed time. So the fundamental question is, are we OK with that? Oh, by the way, we also agreed it's probably not good for them, which is absolutely right. So the simple question is, are we OK with that, and what are we going to do about it? And I warned you, I was, might leave you a little uncomfortable that I was going to stir the pot because I think as community leaders, we should not be comfortable with it and we do have to do something about it. The good news, here's the good news. We actually have an idea of what it takes. Now, there are a lot of people talking about this. I'm not going to pretend to be some genius that's just come up with this myself. Guys like Richard Louvre, L-O-U-V is the last name. It's a great book. He wrote a book called Last Child in the Woods in which he coins the term nature deficit disorder and talks about the fact that kids are spending less and less time outdoors and are no longer able even to negotiate, navigate their communities. They don't know how to walk to a friend's house or to the school because they've been driven literally everywhere. Or Shane Gould, who is a former Olympic swimmer in Australia, when I was speaking at their National Physical Activity Conference in Australia, a couple years ago, she came out to say, I actually think kids are held back by over-organized play, by everything being structured, where there's an adult to say what time we start and when we finish and what the rules are and the boundaries. Where are the negotiation skills? Where is the uh, creativity and the inventiveness of making up your own game and having to pick teams and do all the normal things that we did as kids? None of those skills are being developed. By the way, they're the same skills you use around the boardroom table as an adult. Same skills. You just started developing them when you were eight. And interestingly enough, when we ask parents, why don't you let your kid walk to school anymore? Why, don't you, why can't your kid disappear on a Saturday morning on his bike with his buddies like I used to do? And mom literally didn't know precisely where I was all day until we came home. And she wasn't petrified the whole time. And when we ask them that, they say, well, of course, we can't let them out there. Why? It's not safe. My God, there is a scary, creepy man with a big, thick mustache hiding behind every tree <laughs> ready to abduct my child. This complete psycho guy, right? But indeed, does anybody know what the increase in violent crime against kids by people who don't know them, what's the actual percentage increase over the 30 to 40 year time span we're talking about? 50, 60 percent, 100 percent, is it twice as bad? I'm mean, seeing heads shake. Your heads are shaking because you all know the answer. It came out in, among other places, this special issue of Time Magazine that said it's zero. We've got no evidence that there's more violent crime against kids, none. Over the very time span, we went from roughly 40 to 50% of kids walking to school to now only 10 or 12% that actually walk to school. And the same, the reverse numbers for driving, only 10% used to be driven to school and now it's closer to 40 or 50% driven to school, most schools in this country. Over that time span, no increase in violent crime. Dramatic increase in the media coverage and how much we talk about it. Now other things have changed. Roads are wider, traffic is faster. There are challenging issues for kids out in the real world, but it's not the the one that most parents talk about. We've got to recalibrate our conversation here, which leads me now to my rant, because this is the kind of data Dr. Morrow and others would show you about the nation's obesity epidemic, rising rates of what we call um, a BMI, body mass index, that's a measure of height and weight combined, over 30. Once you get over 30, you're considered obese, and we're now looking at nearly a third of American adults, actually over a third of American adults at that level, and the media is all over this talking about it, and I think they're talking about the wrong thing. 
And I think that we need to recalibrate the conversation. And I think it's well illustrated by the special issue of uh, Time Magazine talking about a disease we used to call adult onset diabetes, adult onset. But we can't call it that anymore. Do you know what the clinical term is for it? Anybody know? It's called type 2 diabetes. And we have to use that term because we don't just see it in adults anymore. We see it in 9 and 10 year old ki kids, like the one pictured here. And th the bulk of the article was devoted to drug research and genetics and things like that. But a very small portion, about half of a column, talked about the most important research in the, in the field in the last 20 years. In which they did a very simple thing. This program called the Diabetes Prevention Program got people from all over the United States of different ages and incomes and ethnic backgrounds and ec educational levels with one thing in common. They were at risk for but had not yet developed diabetes. So they had high blood sugar, basically. And then they put them in one of three uh, intervention groups. One group got the standard counseling. Here's a pamphlet and some information. They put them on a, on a prescription, a pill every day. Second group got the same counseling, same uh, information, and they got a prescription. And what they didn't know, half of them were getting metformin, which is a diabetes drug, and half were getting a placebo. The pill didn't do anything. It's just called a randomized controlled trial. It's a very powerful form of medical research, right? Because even the docs didn't know who was getting the drugs and who wasn't. And then there was a third leg in the trial, and those people didn't get the standard counseling, nor did they get a pill. What they got was put in an intensive lifestyle change program. So they got things like shopping and cooking classes, so they learned how to purchase and prepare healthier foods. And they got at least 30 minutes of physical activity five days a week on an average. We're not talking about training for a marathon, we're talking about going for a mile and a half or two mile brisk walk. Now, who in the room, who has not heard me speak before, knows which of the groups did best? Not a rhetorical question, I'm actually curious if anybody has heard this research. See, that's my problem. Everybody's talking about the obesity epidemic, and what we should be talking about is this. Because what they found was the people who got the drugs, ta-da, 30% reduction in risk of developing type 2 diabetes. 30% reduction. That is a big deal. In fact, it would have been the big news, except for one thing. The people in the lifestyle modification program saw almost twice the risk reduction. Almost a 60% reduction in risk. By changing lifestyle, not by starting on another high-cost drug for the rest of their lives driving healthcare costs through the roof. We know how that game is going right now. Instead, improving lifestyle was the most powerful intervention that they saw. And this is my rant. My rant is, let's stop just talking about an obesity epidemic. Let's talk about the twin epidemics, which is exactly what was intervened upon in this study, physical inactivity and poor nutrition. Because if we get people to change the conversation, it's not just that you're a bad person because you're overweight. It's that we've got to get everybody to be more physically active and eat a better diet. Now we can talk about how we elicit those changes at the social level, at the community level. That's the game. That's the game. That's what we have to apply ourselves. Let me be very clear. These are independent risk factors. What we know is, aside from weight loss, if a person is moderately physically active and eats a healthier diet, they live a longer, healthier life. They cost us less in healthcare dollars. This is a really important takeaway because I think it allows us to think about the entire conversation differently. Now, of those two, I'm going to tend to focus more on the physical activity side, not because it's more important, it's just because that's where my background is. And I think it's, it's an area that you guys, you guys have done a lot of work on the nutrition side in the project here, and you, you could benefit from thinking about this. The other thing is I bring a personal bias. I used to be a competitive athlete, and this is my deep, dark secret that I only tell to my closest friends. I actually was fairly involved in sports, and in fact, with the weirdest of all sports, I, I was involved in the most unusual event in all of, all of the Olympics, frankly. I was a competitive race walker. And uh, yes, you're allowed to laugh. It is the goofiest looking event in track and field. If you've ever seen it, it's the one where they look like they're waddling like a duck. That was me. And, and you can tell it was a very long time ago that I used to do it as based on the fact that we only had black and white photography back then. That's all they had. And the other giveaway is that those shorts were in style back when I was competing <laughs> in the 1920s. That's what that is. And many people will ask, why did you choose to be a competitive race walker? And it's very obvious when I show you the next slide. It was, of course, the huge crowds that showed up at our competitions. <laughs> And, and I'm, I'm not making this up. This is actually the 1984 Olympic trials in the 50-kilometer race walk, which is 31 miles, so it's five miles longer than the marathon. It's the, you can win a bar bet on this. The longest foot race in the Olympics by five miles is the 50K race walk. Like the marathon, you start in the stadium, go out, do a loop in the city, come back, finish in the stadium. And um, so this was, remember Los Angeles hosted the 84 games. This is the LA Coliseum. And they started us at 6 o'clock in the morning to avoid the heat of the day at 10 a.m., when we finished, the stadium was packed, other people were there, the other events were going on. It was really exciting. When we came back through the tunnel and they announced your name. But at 6 in the morning, you have to look very closely to see my mom and dad right over here. <laughs> I'm not making that up. That's really them cheering me on. 
Um, so I worked at the US Olympic Training Center in the bioengineering lab. I worked for Reebok's Human Performance Laboratory. I studied biomechanics at MIT and human performance. So uh, you know, I'm cut from the cloth of the old sports approach. Let's get everybody involved in training for a marathon, going to the gym, working out. That's what we thought was going to be the answer to this physical activity epidemic. But frankly, I can reconstitute the problem very differently with just three numbers. And this is the real challenge that we face, not getting people to train for a marathon, trust me. The three numbers are 30, 25, and 365. And if you don't remember anything else, in fact, when I teach groups how to do public advocacy, how to show up for a city council meeting or a planning commission meeting when they want to testify in favor of a sidewalk or a trail or supporting uh, some new mixed-use development that's going to be more walkable and uh, physically active friendly, or the location of a grocery store in a neighborhood, I say, you don't need to tell a big, long story. Three numbers tells the public health story, 30, 20, 365. 30, that's the minutes per day we're told every American adult should be physically active. It's why they use 30 minutes a day in that study I mentioned a few minutes ago. The research studies say that's enough to help you reduce risk for chronic disease. 20, sadly, is the percentage of American adults that actually get the 30 minutes per day through what we call leisure time physical activity. Consciously going out for a jog, going to the gym, doing a workout. 365, well you would assume days of the year, right? Sadly. Add three numbers, and you have an estimate of the number of premature deaths annually in the United States due to physical inactivity or in poor nutrition, the so-called obesity epidemic. The only thing that kills more Americans prematurely is tobacco and its health influences. And it looks like, you ready for this? Tobacco deaths are flattening and beginning to go down as we've started to change behavior around tobacco consumption in this country, while inactivity and nutrition deaths are going up. It will probably be the number one cause of premature death in this country next time we run these numbers. That's sort of mind-blowing. Lifestyle-based afflictions. And by the way, those three together are essentially what's driving up healthcare costs in this country. It is not infectious disease. It is the diseases associated with unhealthy lifestyles. So let me be clear. National guidelines tell us. So by the way, a quick side note here. If you've been involved in the healthcare debate at all, if you were a state legislator, for example, or a federal legislator, and, I, and when I have my chance to give testimony or when I've spoken to legislative staffs, when they come to me about this, I say the debate is not whether we have a single-payer system or a market-based system. That's rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Until we deal with the chronic diseases associated with unhealthy lifestyles, healthcare costs are going to continue to rise, no matter who's paying for it or how you're trying to do it. That's the problem we face with healthcare in this country. That and an aging population. Put those together, party's over. Having said that, the prescription is straightforward. All we need to do is get people to average about a half an hour a day if they're an adult. As kids, we need more like an hour a day. These are minimum recommendations. We know you benefit if you do more. We also know that it can be broken up. So this kid who's riding his bike along Greenville Boulevard and taking his life into his hands in that sense is indeed <laughs> at least lowering his risk for chronic disease if he gets 30 minutes of bike riding. If it's a 15 minute ride in each direction, then, and I know by the way, he doesn't even think it's an extra, this is not some guy on a $2,000 bike wearing Lycra doing a 40 mile exercise ride. This is somebody making his way to or from work or school or something. You can tell by the bike and his clothes and the knapsack. Um, but that suffices. Even incidental daily physical activity, the walk to the bus stop. Um, Reduces your risk for everything from cardiovascular disease to type 2 diabetes to clinical depression, dementia and old age, a growing list of cancers. For example, we know women are not only at lower risk for breast cancer if they're physically active, but even among women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer, we see higher survival rates among those who at least get that 30 minutes of activity a day. It is as close to the silver bullet as we found in public health. Is that fair? It really is, right? There's no, it's not like there's a, a, a drug um, uh, uh, Lipitor or something that performs any better than moderate daily activity and a healthy diet. Fair? The bad news is that 20% number, this yellow line represents the percentage that get the 30 minutes a day. And the reason I wanted to show the graph, and this will be the last graph I promise, well, next to the last graph, is the line is flat for the last 20 years. We got about one in five Americans hitting it. And this number is an overestimate because it's based on telephone survey results. When we've actually measured objectively, when we put on accelerometers or measurement devices, the number is much closer to 10%. So people tend to tell you what they want to hear when you get them on the phone, is what it, the CDC has learned. For example, they also tend to be taller and weigh less when you're talking to them on the phone. <laughs> it's amazing. They grow an inch, lose 20 pounds. Now, why is this happening? And now are be my last graphs, I promise. I believe the real issue here is the stickiness problem, and this is why we've reconstituted the conversation, why people like you are invited to this discussion. When we've tried to do traditional approaches to exercise, we've run into the problem that I call the stickiness problem. And this study is a great study. A guy named John Jakisic, who's a friend up at University of Pittsburgh's Medical Center, very simple study. All they were trying to do was get people to walk 40 minutes a day. 
they gave, had three groups. One group was told walk your 40 minutes all at once. One was told they could break it into four 10 minute walks at their convenience. And the third was even given a treadmill. So it's short bouts with treadmill. Walk anytime you want, 10 minutes, and jump on the treadmill in your house. And all three groups uh, essentially showed successful increases in exercise minutes over the six months of the intervention in the study. And they did all the things that they know work, like they uh, called them on the phone, sent them email reminders, taught them how to warm up properly and stretch afterwards and select good walking shoes. They gave them exercise diaries. And if you filled out your diary and turned it in every month, you got a prize, like a t-shirt or a water bottle. Because that's what we do in health promotion. We give out t-shirts and water bottles. <laughs> a lot of them. We have, right? Who here in health promotion has been involved in the giving out of t-shirts and water bottles? Not a rhetorical question. See, of course, because it works. It's great. All three groups increase their exercise minutes per week. Interestingly enough, that from a public health standpoint is not the interesting question. The interesting question is what happened after we stopped calling you on the phone and giving you t-shirts and water bottles? Did you continue to increase? Did it plateau and did it drop off? And let me tell you, before I tell you what happened, let me give you the inside scoop, which is at this point, they saw statistically significant increases in aerobic fitness and decreases in weight. Let me just say it again, people were losing weight and getting more fit with moderate daily walking. Again, not training for a marathon. That's the good news. You know what the bad news is? As soon as they stopped calling them on the phone, what do you think happened to their activity levels? That's exactly right. Because it is very hard to get this stuff to stick. We have, we're pretty successful at short-term, acute, intensive programs. Stickiness, that's another story. How do we get it to stay? By the way, not a lot of these kinds of studies in physical activity, many of them in weight loss, all shaped like this. This curve compared, for example, uh, a weight, loss weight watchers to self-help weight loss programs. You'll notice in both cases, early weight loss followed by regain. Sure, weight watchers was more successful, but still regaining the weight after about six months. The point is, stickiness prevails. And if you talk to the leading thinkers in the country on this, they say it's because we have not taken a socio-ecological approach. If we really want to change behavior, at the population level, you got to be involved in all of the cues, all of the influences in a person's life. Not just tell them individually what to do or not to do, but have their family and friends, their personal networks and connections, the workplace, the school, uh, their health care provider, uh, um, the, the community by its very design, and even public policies all encourage the behavior change you want. Now, lest you think, Mark, that sounds like nanny state to me, and we as a nation just don't do that. Think again. Think about, for example, seatbelt use in this country. We've decided that you know, we can save a lot of lives if people use seatbelts, so what have we done? We've actually changed ordinances and done media campaigns and all sorts of things. We've changed the environment around seatbelt use or tobacco. However else you feel about it, we can absolutely point to that as a public health success by changing the norms around tobacco, taxing the product, making it hard to sell to minors, not advertising it on television anymore. Um, and I would argue, a great example that people often forget from public health is sadly being illustrated by the country of Haiti right now, where they're suffering a horrific cholera epidemic because of contaminated water problems, which we would never see in this country because by law, by ordinance, you don't even get a permit for a housing subdivision without having gone through an elaborate process of review of your stormwater, your sanitary sewer, and your water systems. I know that as a guy that serves on a local planning board, how much time we spend talking just about that and who's involved, the health department, public works department, planning staff, right? There are many successes, but I think this one is notable because it does talk about an interplay between those different disciplines, planning, public works, uh, and public health, in creating a public, great public health benefit that nobody would question is worth the effort, worth the money that we invest in that, to avoid diseases like dysentery and, and cholera in our society. OK, so we've got models. By the way, did I say, yes, there is plenty of data to show us the, the success, for example, in tobacco. You'll notice per capita cigarette consumption did not begin to drop way back in the 1960s when we knew cigarettes were bad for us and started talking about it. It's when we engaged in policy level change, tax the products, change the environment, don't advertise on television. All right, for many people, the nutrition side of the equation seems somewhat intuitive. And some of the good work you're already doing around that gets at this. So making available healthier produce. So farmers markets rather than fast food establishments, healthy offerings versus uh, unhealthy vending in schools, for example. Those would be examples that most people would nod their head and they say, I get it. Change the environment, we can change behavior. But with regard to physical activity, many people say, so Mark, is what you're saying that every workplace, every home needs a gym in it? Now, moments ago I just said, formal exercise programs don't seem to be solving the problem. It's not about giving everybody access to a gym. It's giving everybody access to a community where physical activity is actually the easier choice as a part of daily life. That's the trick. And we know this 
from studies out there that actually draw that correlation. So you ought to be saying, okay, smarty pants, fast talking guy from Boston, is there any actual evidence that shows us this is true? And I can tell you about one example study of which there are hundreds, literally hundreds that just happen to be, I, I'm a co-author with Wendy King and others, the American Journal of Health Promotion. We looked at a bunch of women uh, that were in a walking program almost 15 or 20 years ago. We went back and visited with them 20 years later to ask two questions. Who was still walking and what are their health outcomes? And are there any distinguishing characteristics of their environment? In other words, were certain women more likely to keep walking? And what we found were two things. One, the women who were still walking were much healthier, lower rates of diabetes, heart disease, things like that. Two, those women who had two or more destinations in their neighborhood within walking distance had almost twice as many steps as collected by a pedometer, so objectively measured, not based on self-report data. We measured it almost twice as many daily steps as the women who lived in areas where there were just not many places to walk to. Now this doesn't sound like rocket science, does it? In fact, I hope you would all nod your heads and say intuitively, yeah, I would expect people to live in a neighborhood where there's more walking destinations might walk more. But it's great to know we have evidence. And in fact, if you ask me to boil down all that research, the hundreds of studies, I'd say four things characterize environments where people tend to be more physically active as a part of daily life. Indeed, I have made this essentially my mental checklist for every permit that comes before me on the planning board. In my perfect world, I'm able to say yes to each of these. If so, I believe I'm building a stickier environment in my community, one that will be healthier for my kids to grow up in. I have a 13 and a 15 year old. I want them to be the free range kids we were talking about a few minutes ago. These four things allow that to happen. A greater variety of different kinds of destinations within walk, bike, and transit distance. Good facilities to connect those destinations. Sidewalks, trails, bike lanes, safe crossing. The destinations themselves have to be designed in a way that rewards them doesn't punish them for showing them up without a car. In other words, there's a bike rack, not just a bike giant parking lot, right? Simple things like, and indeed it's safe and accessible for all users. The very young, the very old, someone with physical disabilities, wealthy, poor, everybody feels they can use it. By the way, the research, the studies like the ones I just talked about, if you're really a, a nerd and want to read more, you can go to the Centers for Disease Control's Community Guide to Preventive Services for more of that. But by the way, the planners among you would say, geez, I've read the planning articles, I, I go to the conferences, we're talking about this stuff all the time. What you just said was mix of land uses, connected network of facilities, functional site design, universal access. Those, that's language that people in the planning world have been using for quite some time. What we're now saying is there is a clear health motivation to do these things. And again, uh, photos from here, this over by Ridgewood School. Lots of cars came out, lots of buses, a couple of people walking, not as many as I'd like. So let me just amplify those all with photos from the region. We stopped, by the way, in Farmville on the way into town, so some photos from there. Um, but I can talk about the mix of land uses. I mean, think about any town, and you might say, this sounds like an urban prescription. No way. Farmville illustrates sort of the classic downtown with what we call mixed use, retail on the first floor, housing above, compact neighborhoods with shared open space, and the important destination, school, shopping, post office, proximate to the, the downtown, all within walking distance. Think about the traditional small town in eastern uh, North Carolina has that character, right? A traditionally walkable downtown core. And I think it's well illustrated by these boys I met in a workshop in Indianapolis who were so pleased that the parish priest opened a little corner store in the back of his church because he said, you know, it's a, not a neighborhood if you don't have a corner store. This is, by the way, a 13-year-old kid. I'm sure he has not taken a course in urban planning, but he knows it's not a neighborhood without a corner store. Or this corner store operator in Madison, Wisconsin, in an otherwise largely residential neighborhood, who painted a mural on the side of his, his building that says, hey, please drive slowly on this street. Most of our customers come on feet. He gets where his customer base is. They're not driving to his store. It's a local based store. And furthermore, when they had a buy a bike rack program, city says, if you pay for the bike rack, we the city will install it. A nice public private partnership, the kind of thing you could do with CPPW effort, I would presume. Um, he said, yeah, I'll take two. Because I know. That's an economic decision, by the way. This guy is not doing this out of the goodness of his heart because he wants people to get their 30 minutes of physical activity a day. He may not even know about that public health recommendation. He's doing it because it's good business, a good, walkable neighborhood. Second, he needs a sidewalk for people to get to that store. So we need sidewalks, bike lanes, trails, and transit. And I mentioned transit as a part of the active transportation network because we know people who take transit tend to get more of their 30 minutes per day. And I was intrigued by the notion that there are really three apparently separate transit systems, the Pitt County, uh, 
the, uh, the Greenville area and then the ECU transit system. And it begs the question, are they well unified? Are they well integrated? And if not, could you do a better job of that? Because transit is an important piece of the active transportation network. Third, the destination when I get there should say, yes, come as a pedestrian. You're welcome to walk here. Feel comfortable. As opposed to, no, this is designed for an automobile. And if you walk here, you take your life in your hands just getting from the bus stop to the front door, from the sidewalk to the entrance of the building which I'm sure is not true with that Walmart. I'm just using it as an example. I'm sure it's very easy and safe to walk across that parking lot where you can play a game of Frogger with the vehicles, right? <laughs> Most often with the people who are circling around for the good spaces so they don't have to walk all the way across. And let me just say this. This building in uh, Lawrence, Kansas is a, um, is a Talbot's, which is a national women's clothing chain. You guys are familiar with Talbot's, which you might see right next to a Bed Bath & Beyond or a, or a, you know, a Barnes & Noble, whatever, I mean, in a, in a series of big box stores. But you don't. In Lawrence, it's right up at the street designed with awnings and street trees and in a very uh, sort of in-town feel because that's what the local zoning ordinance is. And they're happy to build, well, you know, that's what the ordinance says, that's what you're gonna get, right? But if the ordinance says 200 foot setback, giant parking lot out in front and you can't use any shared parking, then that's what you get. Um, things like, indeed, uh, uh, bicycle parking, all of these. And these things which we used to think of as amenities, trees and benches, my 82-year-old mother-in-law taught me, you know, if the tree provides her shade and the bench is a place for her to stop, it may be the difference between her choosing to walk to the pharmacy and not. They're not just amenities. They are functional attributes of the transportation system. We need to be really crystal clear about that. And let me say it again. Functional attributes of the system that can affect what travel mode somebody chooses. Last but not least, safety. This is a moment where I must defend my, defend my brethren in the engineering world because they've taken a pretty bad rap. Everybody says, well, it's the engineers. They're building these big wide roads to move more cars, which is exactly what we asked them to do for the last 50 years. Well, I don't want to ever have to sit through two light cycles anywhere, right? Especially making a left turn at rush hour from Evans onto Greenville Boulevard. God forbid I get caught in that light and have to sit through two cycles. So we add lanes, we change the light cycle so the pedestrian crossing phase is very short. That's what we asked them to do. They're not bad guys. We said that's what we want. We need to ask for something else because if we do, they know how to do it. They know how to put mid-block crossings on even busy roads. They know how to build roundabouts instead of stoplights that make it slower and safer. By the way, for motor vehicles as well as bicyclists and pedestrians, fewer collisions, fewer conflicts in that design. Or simple things like curb extensions where the sidewalk bumps out like you see in right in downtown Greenville. You guys know what this is. Why is that beneficial to the pedestrian? Think about it. These pedestrians now can see beyond the parked cars, are more visible to the oncoming vehicles, so it changes their sight lines, and the amount of time they are out in the road is reduced. Again, 80 two-year-old mother-in-law, less exposure in the street. She likes it. So those are, again, functional design attributes that change the environment for the pedestrian. It's why you think it's more pleasant to walk there. And I give examples. In fact, uh, the one I often ask, this is Traffic Engineering 101. Why would that pedestrian be forced to take a little jog to the right rather than able to walk straight across the street? Why is that crosswalk designed with a little zigzag in it? Anybody know this? Who's not seen this before? It's a test of your uh, in intuitive skills. What is she forced to do when she goes through the middle of the island there, the little protective refuge? Look to the right. She looks right toward the oncoming traffic, doesn't she? So it increases the likelihood that she'll yield appropriately to the vehicles and or make eye contact and get a yield from the driver. We love that kind of an installation in front of schools in particular where we've got the least skilled, most vulnerable pedestrians. It's what I recommend. If you're going to do an island, do it that way. So, by the way, this is uh, with Briarcliff right out in front of Lake Forest Elementary. Uh, lots of houses over there. Kids could be walking to the school. Some parents say three-lane road, a little scary to me. But what if this were a more protective island, not just a painted one? Um, and I say island because, indeed, you've used median islands. On this portion of Fire Tower Road, DOT was allowed to do it. My understanding is on the portion adjacent, it was not. Just to the, what, east of there, west of there, that portion did not get the, the lanes, and in part because if I understand it, businesses didn't want it, I think to their detriment. I think what you do when you have that big, clear, open turning lane, that's just a free fire zone for collisions. It does not make left turns any easier, and, and it's certainly worse for pedestrians and bicyclists and tends to increase speeds. It makes it feel like what it is, which is a landing strip for the space shuttle. That's what Greenville feels, or a fire tower feels like in that section. I say Greenville because it's got sections that feel like that as well. Um, let me give you another kind of wonky example because you say, well, Mark, that's going to cost some money. And it will. Yeah, building islands and said much cheaper to do if you do it when you build the road rather than go in and retrofit it or when you're doing a repaving project anyway. But how about something that doesn't cost much at all? This is from Farmville, but you got a lot of this what we call diagonal parking in downtown 
Greenville, it's nice, I like it, that it gets more cars parked so we don't have to create big surface parking lots. Businesses like it because it's good for high turnover, a customer can come in, grab something, be on their way, all good. Problem is, when my mom pulls in with my kids in the car and parks her little Honda Civic next to that van, when she opens the rear doors, where do the kids tend to go? And when she goes to put the groceries in the trunk, where's she standing? And when she goes to pull out, what is she looking at? Side of a big white van, not oncoming traffic, not the bicyclist she's going to clip, right? I mean, it's, I mean, I'm not blaming, I'm just saying she's maybe asking my son in the backseat, so how's it look out there, honey? Because I'm sure that's right in the North Carolina driver's manual. Ask child in the back seat <laughs> whether the travel lane is clear before departing a reverse di uh, di diagonal path. What could I do to save all the benefits, namely the narrowing of the street, which you get when you do diagonal parking that tends to bring speeds down, the higher density and so on, but solve those problems? So how can I get everything that's a benefit but solve all three of those problems with a redesign? Anybody ever seen reverse diagonal parking? Where instead of pulling in frontwards, you pull past and then back into the spot. Des Moines, Iowa actually restriped that road to install it. Now, think for a moment. When I open the car doors, where do the kids go? Doors are in the way, they can't go in the road. When grandma puts in the groceries, she is standing on the sidewalk, and when she goes to pull out, what's she looking at? Travel lane. The entire, and the entire cost of this is signage, changing the angle of the stripes, and probably a media campaign or some other kind of educational outreach to tell people, this is how we're doing parking in downtown now. And in Des Moines, what the traffic engineer and the local uh, police chief told me is, for the first two weeks, they parked a squad car the right way so that everybody knew you're supposed to be facing out. They left one of the squad cars there and everybody pulled up and said, well, the cops parked that way. I guess that's what I'm supposed to do. And the signs, they did a little media campaign. Now, when I tell communities, you ought to try this, what's their first reaction? Oh my God, people can't do that here. I'll never fly here. That maybe happened in Des Moines, but because you know, as we all know, Des Moines is a big liberal enclave and they're very, like what, they're more progressive than you? I don't get that. But the other answer is we just don't have drivers that can do that. To which I ask, if they can't turn around and back into an empty parking space, are we sure we want them backing out into an active travel lane? Which is what they're doing right now. And that's not a joke. Traffic Engineering 101 says either they can do a reverse maneuver or they sure as heck should not be doing it onto an active travel lane. This is a better design, fewer cost of collisions, and uh, better for bicyclists and pedestrians. Cheap. My only point is this, it's not all really expensive stuff. Some of the stuff that enhances, in this case, the bicycling environment gets pedestrians off the street, safer for cyclists, is short money. It's more about political will. It's more about somebody saying, you know, we gotta try that. We got three blocks of it downtown, let's give it a shot. By the way, you might say, Mark, this sounds like a very urban story. I'm back to my, my, my point about Farmville. If you look at the population, this is anything but an urban story. I believe it is the pit counties of America that this has to happen, that you guys have to step up. Here's why. If you look at population shift over the last 50 years, uh, the mayor and I were just talking about bowling alone, and, uh, uh, and this is from Robert Putnam's book. And what we saw over the last 50 years is dramatic drops in our urban population. And where is that population going? Not out into the, I'm sorry, rural population, the countryside. And they're not going into the cities. What they're doing is going into suburbia. And they're not consciously moving into suburbia. What's really happening is suburbia is consuming that landscape and turning it into this. Yet again, another housing subdivision, housing subdivision, housing subdivision mall, housing subdivision, housing subdivision, office park, giant centralized school out on the edge of town where it's cheapest, where we can save the bucks. That land pattern, by definition, requires almost every trip by automobile. So those things matter. A quick note, I should really add a fifth element because I've talked all about the physical activity side of the equation. We know that these environmental factors influence nutrition. You guys are working very hard on these things. Things like community gardens, farmers markets, and getting people access to those. But you could go the whole nine yards and talk about wild stuff like where you want fast food establishments. Um, because one of the things we know, for example, is that fast food, you tell me, what neighborhoods tend to see the most fast food establishments? Are they your wealthiest, sort of highest income neighborhoods? No. What you tend to see is a combination of low car ownership and high density fast food restaurants being those neighborhoods which are A, lowest income and B, highest risk for obesity in our society. Because those people now without a car can't even escape those as their only food choices. So we are creating what has been termed in some of the research literature obesogenic environments for our poorest residents. Should we be surprised that low income is highly correlated to high rates of chronic disease? Not a little. We shouldn't be so. So there's my prescription. 
If you said to me, Mark, read the research literature, no judgment, no opinion, what does the research say? Mr. MIT brain engineer, just read the science. Those five things create environments where I'll see lower risk for chronic disease associated with physical activity and inactivity and poor nutrition. Mixed use, network of facilities for physical active travel, rewarding the active traveler, safe and accessible for all, healthy food as part of the fabric of it. Active living research is maintained by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation at uh, University of San Diego. Now, before we sort of say nice health idea, but that can't sell it, there are a lot of uh, uh, concerns out there that agree with this model of community design. So in other words, we see people that are in the environmental movement saying it reduces air, air, air pollution, water pollution, and noise pollution, traffic congestion. The public safety says, folks say, yes, if we design these kinds of systems, we're going to run over fewer bicyclists and pedestrians, fewer young and old pedestrians, the most dangerous, I, I'm sorry, endangered pedestrians on the street, the very young, the very old. Um, we see social equity people saying we're making a more equitable transportation system if you don't have to drive everywhere. And we're increasingly seeing schools very interested in this. Schools that are saying, we're spending millions busing kids, and if some of those kids, at least those that are close enough, could walk and bicycle, we can save dollars on transportation. But we are also learning in study after study now that more physically active students actually perform better academically. Kids who walk and bike to school have an opportunity to get routine daily physical activity. We're seeing higher housing values in neighborhoods that are more walk and bike friendly. There's really interesting data on this. During the recent downturn in the economy, they saw lower foreclosure rates in more walk and bike friendly neighborhoods. Let me say that again. Lower foreclosure rates in those neighborhoods where people had options and didn't have to maintain a three or a four car household. If they could drop back to two cars because they had other ways to get places. And indeed, the National Association of Realtors in both their summer 2010 and winter 2011 publications, it comes out biannually, it's called On Common Ground, has focused specifically on these kinds of questions. In the 2010 issue, they asked, what does the next generation of home buyers want? And look at the cover. I mean, look at the cover of this thing. The National Association of Realtors. I'm expecting a kind of a nice big suburban home with a four-car garage and a couple of SUVs in the parking lot, big three-acre lot. That's what I would assume would be the cover. But no, their cover is a girl on a bike in a downtown, an in-town environment with a baguette in the basket, for God's sakes, and sunflowers. Have they gone soft on us? These are supposed to be business people. And that's what they're saying. They're saying the business of selling homes is a different game now. People want to be able to walk to a corner store or to the five corners, to the downtown area where there's an umbrella, uh, an umbrella market on Wednesday nights, right? I guess it got rained out last night, I suspect. Uh, or walk to a nearby farmer's market or walk their kid to school. They're actually asking for that. That's their aspiration. <clears throat> and indeed, the model of development of just moving big box stores out and strip malls out to the fringe has really shown to be fairly unsustainable. Even here I can find the pictures of the empty, you know, the empty Home Depot, the, the underutilized malls. Um, and when we went that way, what did we do? We sucked the life out of our downtowns too. So we killed ourselves in two ways. We created an unsustainable version of economic development on the perimeter. And, and I'm not saying we shouldn't have malls and buy, but maybe we want to be designing them differently. We have now strong enough evidence. So there are a lot of people in the conversation, including, and this is my point, when we had a panel yesterday and John Chafee from uh, the Eastern North Carolina region sort of economic development entity said, yeah, we're talking about these kinds of things now. We know this is the new model for economic development. OK, take a breath. Home stretch, home stretch. I'd like to cut to the chase with some specific thoughts about this community based on the evidence. So, Given you an evidence base, I would submit to you pretty inarguable what I've told you so far, because the research is there. Now we go to some uh, ideas about how to move ahead. We have historically only done programmatic approaches. Encourage people to uh, exercise more. Encourage people to eat a healthier diet. The program stuff. We've got to move to projects, creating physical environments, and even more, the gold standard policies. Why go in and try to retrofit sidewalks project by project into neighborhoods that didn't have sidewalks? Why not in change, instead change the rules so we don't build a subdivision without sidewalks in the first place? Does everybody agree that if I believe sidewalks in neighborhoods are important, that it's better to have a policy requiring them than to go back and try to fix them after we've built subdivisions without them? Okay, that's the difference between the project approach and the policy approach. Now, you want to argue about sidewalks, you can say, no, we want to maintain our rural environment. But man, I got a lot of pictures that suggest to me that's not rural, that's suburbia that you're building out there. That's what those subdivisions look like. So what would I do? 
These six things is what I'd recommend. Six, you're already working hard on, but the first five, in fact, let me say this, I think you're working on all of these. You're doing some great stuff in each of these areas. I would challenge you to go to the next level. That's what the CPPW grant was. It was really awarded to you because you're making good progress and they say, go to the next level. Be a model for the rest of North Carolina and the rest of the country. So, more, more focus on complete streets, more mixed use development, safe routes to school as an institutional norm, a transportation trail network, unified transit system, and then the healthy food system. So let me talk about each a little bit, all with illustrations from here. Complete streets is a very simple premise. I'm curious who has heard the term before, just so I have a sense of the room. Premise is pretty straightforward. It says, every time I touch a road, it is only complete if I've taken into account all four user groups, the pedestrian, the bicyclist, transit, and motor vehicle. It does not say, go to the national website of the campaign, they will not say, stripe a bike lane on every street. That's not what it says. It says, always ask the question about all four user groups. Different roads, different contexts will be designed differently. Um, so you've got a very complete street on 5th near ECU. I don't submit to you that Greenville Boulevard down here near the Hilton where I was staying is quite as complete because that pedestrian sort of feels like an afterthought out there. Now, completeness might be enhanced simply by the striping of crosswalk and the placement of the pedestrian signal buttons there, the signal heads. In other words, I'm not saying you have to change that road entirely, but just making that crossing. I tried to walk from the Hilton up to Panera Bread and back to get a bowl of soup last night and felt a little like an interloper, like I wasn't supposed to be. There's a really nice sidewalk most of the way, but getting across, man, that was like a roll of the dice. I really felt a little like a target. You paint one on my back. And, and I'm not being sarcastic. This is anywhere in America, but I'm trying to give you a sense that making this street more complete might be as simple as a first step as striping the crosswalks and putting pedestrian signals. You with me on this? I want to make sure. I'm not saying it's a total redesign to the tune of $5 billion of all of Greenville Boulevard. We need to be realistic and understand we're going to do this stuff incrementally. So understanding that new construction, you might have different expectations than existing. For new construction, let's not build subdivisions without sidewalks. And let's go a step further and say, you know, when we're building these subdivisions, let's not just require the sidewalk inside, but what about that frontage road along, for example, Thomas Langston? Why does the sidewalk end at the edge? If this developer owned a thousand feet of frontage, why wouldn't the sidewalk continue along there? So when the next three subdivisions are built, we string them together. And all of a sudden, we've got a mile's worth of sidewalk along Thomas Langston by virtue of it. No single entity bearing too much of a burden, but the property owner doing it on their property. That would be an example, the kind of thing, for example, we even do on my planning board. Um, but trail linkages to nearby schools and parks, pedestrian crossings, things like that. And indeed, one of the modest changes that many communities we've worked with have made is when what, a, what we call a traffic impact analysis is required. Now that's a new development is going in, retail or re residential or mixed. Normally what we do is we estimate the number of cars and do a traffic impact analysis. We say, oh, that's going to generate about 1,000 motor vehicle trips per day. It's going to have this influence on the intersection. And indeed, we may compel the developer to add a turn lane or help us pay for the signalization of that, right? The intersection put in a signal light. Why do we only talk about the car? Why don't we do a multimodal transportation analysis and say, it'll generate this many car trips, but it could also generate this many walking trips if there was a good connection to the nearby school, and this many transit trips if there was a nice transit stop. Those could be the elements of mitigation. All travel modes could be mitigated when we do design. Include the striping of the, the crossing at the entrance to the mall when you build it. Or include the connection from, if the building is going to be set back, this is one from Tolland, Connecticut, where they just said, good, if, if, if the building must be set back, then let's just make sure we can walk safely to the front of the building. Then yes, that's going to alter your parking, and we're going to ask for some landscaping, it could cost you a little more, but it's that, or you can bring the building up to the street and put the parking behind your option, Mr. Developer. In other words, it doesn't have to be overly prescriptive. But I would say it shouldn't just be request, and I would even say more than reward. Let's require these kinds of changes. What about on existing roads? Well, I'm back to my it doesn't have to cost a million dollars example. This is a road in Urbana, Illinois, four lanes. They had a lot of collisions. People would turn left. The guy behind them would either rear end them or try to go around them, cause a collision in the right lane. They gave that road what they call a diet, a road diet. That's the term they actually use out there because they went from four lanes to three, one in each direction with a turn lane. But they really added two more, which are two bike lanes over here because they now were skinnier. And they could put center islands in, those kinds with the offset for the pedestrian crossings. Dramatically has reduced collisions, has made it much safer for bicyclists and pedestrians. Same road before and after, and just as much traffic flow. Now you say, nice idea, and it's really only about paint. I mean, for the most part, the cost of that was done during a repaving project. I'm thinking the next time you go to touch First Street in front of the town common, 
take those bike lanes that you've got further down the road and carry them through. This could be given a diet. You could go to a single center turn lane, travel lane in each direction, bike lane on each side. You say, but Mark, we've got parking over on that side of the street. Can you put bike lane par next to parking? You do just down the road, right? That's a bike lane next to parking. It's exactly the design you've got. My point is you already have this modality. You're doing great stuff. Continue to do it. When you go to touch that road, that's the opportunity to make that improvement at a very modest cost. Because now all we're talking about is where the lines go. We're still you know, doing the repaving work that we would do anyway. And indeed, you passed a resolution in general about committing to this at the co council level, for example. Um, I would go to the next level and pass a policy resolution about complete streets. They have model language on that uh, uh, website. And I'd put together a working group, if you're asking me specific steps going forward, working group that really works closely with the Department of Transportation, DPW, about actually laying out updated roadway guidelines that say, let's talk about roadways that serve all four user groups, not just the automobile, and then let's bring it to our routine daily work. So that's a concrete recommendation. It is an actionable item. North Carolina DOT is in the midst of this conversation. They're going to be re receptive to this. The commissioner at the state level is receptive to complete streets. They want to see it happen at local. You guys should be a model. Beat, beat the other communities, your competitive communities, the communities you're competing with for business. Beat them to the punch. Do it here first. Second, you're really thinking about your downtown. You're doing re good revitalization work. But I can't state this enough. You need people living down there. That's what really repopulates the street. People make it a great destination on Wednesday night, that's fine. But better still, make it a great time every night by people living there. Make it a great place to live and then other folks will want to get there because there will be street side cafes and internet uh, cafes and it won't just be you know, college bars, it will be this mix of activities that define all kinds, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, draw in all kinds of users. There's some really great stuff already happening, but I can't say it enough, residential, residential, residential and continue to do the good stuff like the calming the traffic and, and in creating an inviting space that people want to get out and be on foot. Um, third, as you think about your design guidelines for, uh, I'm sorry, second, for residential areas, try to mimic the in-town grid with the new subdivisions that are being built. Think about things like corner stores and even alleyways and in-law apartments. So this is new development from Bluffton, South Carolina, where they mimic what the older town looked like with alleys, with the garages facing the alleys, not the front streets. So you end up with these nice uninterrupted sidewalks. And I can have my mother-in-law living in that apartment if I really wanted that, which I'm not sure I do. But I'm just saying, you could. And, and all of a sudden, you've made a much more mixed income level in that neighborhood. Not just the person could afford to buy the house, but the college student who could rent the apartment out back or the, the elderly person on a fixed income. And third, to really mix things up, really try to encourage, when you're doing more retail development, a true mixed-use approach. So what you tend to get right now are still the big malls, whether they're strip malls or box arrangements or, or enclosed malls. <clears throat> but there are mod models out there, and this is one over in Chapel Hill, and I only use it because I happen to be there recently enough to have photos. With it created a new little village downtown, but they have a range of housing types from single family to townhouses and a trail network that goes through it. There are developers out there interested in doing this stuff. Woo them. Woo them to hear and say, Greenville is ready. We have a sophisticated enough community and buyers that are going to want this. The EPA and other groups have published things on this. And I, you know, I don't know about the, the term smart growth. You can either like or not. But a couple of the principles about what they're recommending for rural communities are really about healthy economic growth. And two of the biggies for here, in the end, You've got an infrastructure authority that's out there laying roads and putting out utilities and stuff like that. Then you've got a planning entity that's saying, we want to see growth here and not there. Those two have to be matched. Because if you're putting roads and sewer out here and then saying, but we want the growth here, don't kid yourself. The growth is going to go where you put infrastructure, right? I mean, we all know that's how that works. So if you know, match those up, and while you're at it, one of the recommendations, I swear to God, I didn't say either of these two things, by the way. This is not the, the this is sort of the weirdo New England guy throwing out crazy ideas. These both came out of the summit yesterday. Think about an urban growth boundary, actually defining where you want growth to happen right now and where you don't. Because if you really want to push people back into the core and see the dollars generating core growth, economic development in the core, then say we're not going to go beyond this line. And what you do, by the way, is you preserve agricultural areas that are, in some cases, some of your highest quality agricultural areas, the ones proximate to the town. Third, safe routes to school. 
You have a great group working on this already. I cannot say enough about the good work they're doing. In fact, we're joined by Aaron from the school district who's done a lot with the busing and has become a lightning rod because he's recommending things like collected bus stops rather than a bus at a stop at every driveway, making the routes much more efficient and, God forbid, allowing the kids to actually walk a little bit, even the bus riders, which is a very fundamental premise. Let's get all kids more safe activity, all students, not just those within walk and bike distance in the school. So some great ideas, good stuff happening. They need your support and you need to make this policy. So things like, this is by the way the traffic leaving Ridgewood and you'll notice there are all the cars piling out and then the bus is caught behind them. One of the simple things some of the schools have done, you ready for this that are doing this? They give a five minute early release to the buses and those kids who are walking and biking, our preferred travel modes. It's creating essentially a disincentive to drive to the school and an incentive to walk, bike, or take transit, which is what the school bus is. It's a form of mass transit. Much more efficient, much safer than the individual automobile. Right? We want kids on those buses. If we're providing and paying for the bus service, let's get them on that. Well, let's incent that rather than this lineup of traffic being in front of all those vehicles. Um, and you know, the, the program uses all five E's, the, fed, the federal money that comes through the state DOT that we're hoping gets to you guys in the very near future, sort of encourages everything from encouragement programs to safety education for the kids, engineering improvements. Um, but I think one of the most important things is to continue to ask the question, this last one, evaluation, do show of hand surveys, ask the kids, how are you getting to school now, by what travel mode, why? You know, a lot of communities around the country are talking about measuring kids' height and weight and measuring, reporting their BMI to the parents. It's not what we need to hear. What we need to hear is how the kids are getting to school because I gotta tell you, you got a lot of school officials that are gonna be shocked when they see the numbers. This is data from Scotland. They did it on the national level in Scotland, but it's a small country, I get that. But the point is, nearly 50% of kids are walking and biking to school there. In the United States, you know what kind of numbers we see? We see as much as 35 to 40%. This is the data from Ridgewood coming by private car. Now, in theory, at this school, every kid is either within the half-mile walking zone or they're provided bus service. Is that right, Aaron? I want to make sure I'm clear on that. That's what the plan is. So why are 35 to 40 percent of the kids at Ridgewood and Lake Forest coming by private automobile? Oh, there's bullying on the bus. The ride's too long. We were running late this morning. It's rainy. I don't know if they want him to. Does he have to really walk down the street to a stop? There are a lot of whiny answers for that. And I, lest you think that I don't practice what I preach, my wife organized in our neighborhood a walking school bus. It's a group of kids that walk every day. She organized all the parents. We had a schedule. One mom was on one day, another on another. I was, any day I was home, I walked with the kids. So these walking school buses can work. Groups of kids walking with adult supervision. Because that's one of the complaints we get. I can't let them walk. I'm worried about them crossing the street without adult supervision. Good. Let's create that. You have a group working on that. We're creating walk to bus stops. We talked about this yesterday. How about shelters at those bus stops for the parent who says, but I don't want them to have to stand out in the rain. If it, okay, good. Let's build a shelter at the collected neighborhood bus stop so that bus doesn't have to stop at every driveway. My point is this. There are good answers to all of this. We either have to philosophically decide we're going to move in this direction institutionally, or we can say, you know, we're going to allow the whiners to take the day on this. We're going to just give up the ghost and accept, wait for it, that one in three kids born today will get type 2 diabetes in their lifetime because they are so physically inactive. One in three. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm ready to deal with things like heavy book bags and places for the kids to walk and all the other reasons they can't. You know, we'll come up with answers to those. So whether it's Getting the data or figuring out, putting our schools in places and designing the sites in such a way that the maximum number can walk and bike. By the way, in Columbia, Missouri, they recognized they had a park right next to the school and simply dropping the kids off on the other side of the park. They didn't have to cross the street, walk through the park. Every kid, even those coming by bus and car, got at least a 10 minute walk in both directions every day. That changed the fabric of it. And they've collected data just presented at the National Safe Routes to School Conference showing fewer behavioral problems fewer reports to the uh, principal's office, and better academic performance as they've shifted the kids' behavior. More kids getting more physical activity. And let's go into the schools that don't have it and retrofit facilities for maybe the five-minute early release or uh, um, putting in the missing trails and so on. The connections. Four. We're on the home stretch, I promise. Last couple. You're doing some great work with your greenways and trails. I love the system that's here already. It is compelling. You need small links into the neighborhoods. The next phase is not so much about the next 20 mile segment. I would submit it's more about connecting a school to a playground, to a neighborhood, senior housing, to a farmer's market, to a shopping area. 
It's the small links that fly. In fact, this, these, this data comes from, these, these recommendations come from a study by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that say connecting to destinations and connecting to the other parts of the system, sidewalks, bike lanes, transit stops, those are the things that make a trail system really work. A trail system that depends on people driving to trailheads to go out and do exercise, and then it, it fails because it's still the old model, the go to exercise model. A trail system that goes right into the fabric of the neighborhoods, that's what works. And by the way, you have the beginnings of that. Build that plan out and implement it. And it's going to take time, so be patient, but keep chipping away. Fifth, and this is really my last one. You've got these three different transit systems. I, in the short time I've here, have not gotten a good sense of how well integrated they are. But what I do know is only one of them have bike racks on the front, for example. Uh, the, greater, the Greenville Transit does, but the, 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 the university buses don't appear to, and the Pitt County vans don't. Um, uh, so I'm thinking integrating those systems, getting bike racks on all the buses, and even building a downtown multimodal transportation center, which I know is sort of a topic of discussion, it really fits into the mix. Make it a state-of-the-art transit center. There are really cool models. You can go look at big cities like Chicago and Minneapolis and smaller ones, but they're doing things like having, it, it'll be a hub for all the buses, obviously, but put in there indoor bicycle parking in a shared bike or a rental bike system. How about lockers and shower rooms for people who bike commute to the downtown area to actually, so if I don't have a workplace that's large enough to have its own locker, I can ride into town, park my bike there, shower up, go to work. Now that's kind of creative stuff. How about a bike mechanic on duty two days a week to actually, I, I guarantee you there's a college kid who we could pay not a lot of money to would, you know, staff one of those and, and it would change the complexion. I mean that's what an innovative multimodal transportation center feels like and there are communities around the country. We can give you examples, find communities, show you stuff like that. Um, and once you've got that, you can do other what we call transportation demand management policies. Do the students' IDs, they can ride, I assume, the ECU bus. Can they ride the Greenville bus for free? No. no. Okay, so they still pay a fare. In some communities, they make it automatic that the student ID works for any of the transit systems, and they pay a fee to the transit system. It benefits the transit system. That is, the school does. Um, thinking about things like pa valet parking. Does anybody do any b valet bicycle parking at big events like the umbrella thing or the or farmer's market or any of that? Okay, so you can like, invite a, a high school team. The high school football team could set up a corral and for a, you know, 50 cents, a dollar, whatever, just for tips, do bike parking, valet style bike parking. You pull up on your bike, you give it to them, they park it for you when you're done. And you can also give away prizes. The CPBW project could give away bags that you could carry home your healthy produce from the great farm market that says, I rode my bike to the farmer's market. I mean, that's the kind of sort of systemic change that gets people to think differently about this. I love, speaking of farmer's markets and community gardens and things like that, what you're doing on the nutrition front, and all I would say is more, 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 more community gardens. We talked about the fact a lot of the stuff is congregated on the south side of the river, lower population density I get on the north side of the river, you don't have near, but, but still maybe some community gardens up there, things like that. Continue to think about how that. Some places have done, by the way, mobile farmers markets. So they rotate locations or they even, uh, we talked about trucks, you know, a farm truck be acting as a sort of a mini, pulling into a church parking lot or a community center as, as, a, as a stop. The really courageous, the wild stuff, limiting where fast food places can go. Or just say, we've got enough. We don't need any more McDonald's and Chick-fil-A. Lest you think I'm making this up, Los Angeles County has put in place a moratorium on the development of any more fast food, and it is one of the recommendations that came out of the summit yesterday. Literally, put in, your, in place a one-year moratorium, and while you're doing it, use as your justification, we're going to study where the fast food restaurants are conglomerating and how that relates to health outcomes, and I know what you're going to find. I know what you're going to find, right? You guys know what you're going to find, aren't you? Highest fast food densities, highest rates of obesity, ill health, chronic disease risk. So pretty good justification. And you can take these conversations into the schools you already are. I just want to commend that. Don't back down. Go to the policy level. Get the board to actually vote on this stuff. Actually, I mean, just to give you a sense, concessions. This sounds scary. You're telling me at the high school football game they're not going to sell those nachos with the yellow gloppy stuff on them? You know what I mean? The, the chips with the yellow goop? That's what, and I know this because my son played freshman football and the freshman parents have to run the, the, the concession stand at the, at the high school games. And uh, my wife and I, the week it was our turn, she said, I should put some healthy options out there. And I said, all right, let's see how that goes. Because there's pizza, there's hot dogs, there's these nacho things. She said, well, what I'm going to do is, so we got a bushel of apples. We had, it's fall, right, these delicious New England apples, fresh. String cheese, low-fat string cheese, granola bars, stuff like that. She, she sold like 50 cents for all those things. All of it got bought. In fact, at one point, one of the freshman football players came up and said, Mrs. Fenton, 
because she put like 25 cents on the apples. I said, you can't give them away free. They have to have a value. So she put 25 cents. And one of the boys said, Mrs. Fenton, can I really get four apples for a dollar? He said, yeah. So he said, I got two bucks. He was going to get a pizza slice. Instead, he went away with eight apples to his buddy. He goes, guys, look at this. It's like he had stolen the apples. He was so psyched. <laughs> we can actually do this stuff. I swear to God, we can. It's possible. I, I'm quite convinced. A friend of mine, Tim Bustos, says you need the golden triangle. You need con concerned citizens encouraging elected and appointed officials to tell their professionals, the planning staff, public works, public health, how they want it to happen. The private sector is often the economic engine, that is, they're the developers that are paying for new development. And we need all that to happen. And I think my final recommendation is, we gotta give political cover to the elected. I know that as a, an elected board member, the easiest way for me to vote for the sidewalk requirement in a, in a subdivision review is if a half dozen or more citizens show up during the public testimony part of the, of the, the hearing and actually ask for it. Because then I can say, I'm reflecting the citizen's request. But if nobody shows up and the developer asks for a waiver and says, I shouldn't have to build the sidewalk, pretty hard for me or anybody else on the board to justify voting for the sidewalk, right? So we got to get people engaged. Outreach, advocacy training. This theme came up a dozen times, at least, in the conversation yesterday. We need to continue to build a core of aware and encouraging citizens so that <laughs> essentially politicians have, and some communities actually said this, so that they will make me do the right thing. I have had elected officials say, I know I want to do this stuff, but I need the support. I need people to show up and say it. So I think that's one of the final things you do. And indeed, I would say if you were to build a sort of an organization, organizational plan around this, the, the CPBW leadership team could do this political cover project. Then you could have action teams around each of the topics that I've just represented, tackling these in detail the complete streets, mixed-use development, all of them. Uh, and to some degree, you've got this already happening. I'd formalize this a little more, because what you'll find as you formalize it, there are going to be natural linkages between the action teams. The very group that's out there building trails will talk to the people doing safe routes to school and say, help me figure out what the priority routes are connecting schools to neighborhoods. Because in the end, I'm, 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 this is my story and I'm sticking with it, it's not really about building a sidewalk or a community garden. It's about the vision and the capacity to do that all the time, and it is never about the money. I will have, I have worked with communities that don't have two nickels to rub together. They're doing great stuff. I've been in communities that are really, really wealthy, and they're not doing squat. It is not about the money. It's about changing the policy so that when the opportunity comes, when the grant is out there, when we're repaving the road anyway, we can do, when the subdivision is being built, we do the right thing right from the ground up. And that means it's about vision and leadership. So that's my challenge to the group. And if you ask me why I'm a raving, froth at the mouth, lunatic about this stuff, I met this woman in Plainfield, Indiana. It's just outside of Indianapolis. And they had just finished this trail system and built this beautiful bridge connecting neighborhood trails to a community center to the downtown park. I said, do you mind if I take your picture on the new bridge? She goes, no, go ahead. And I said, so pretty cool. They just finished the bridge this summer. She goes, oh my god, it's been a lifesaver for me. I said, really? A lifesaver? And this is true. And I didn't pry. I mean, I just said, really? Because like, I thought that was strong words for a bridge, right, on a trail. She said, yeah, we're kind of going through a tough time right now. My daughter, Sarah, is being treated, and I think she told me for a form of childhood leukemia. But what it required was that she take these immunosuppressant drugs that suppress her immune system, making her much more vulnerable to things like getting a cold from other kids. So she didn't really play with other kids and stuff. She said, the one time during the day she seems to be happy is when we're riding the bike together. But I would never ride the bike out on a busy road. It's dangerous. It'd be scary. I don't want her to be exposed to the, you know, the exhaust from cars. But on the trails, she can laugh and giggle. It's the one time she seems happy. We can ride to the park. She sees other kids. She doesn't feel like a baby in a bubble. She says, but we couldn't do that before they finished the bridge and the trail. Now that it's done, I can do that. You know, <laughs> talk about pulling on my heartstrings. I thought, that's amazing. But then I thought, is it worth, you know, bridge for one person having this benefit? But Sarah is a euphemism for a lot of other people. She's a euphemism for the elderly shut-in who lives in a neighborhood who uh, right now has to call her daughter-in-law for a ride or try to get a ride on the shuttle to go to the pharmacy. She doesn't drive anymore, but could maybe walk to the pharmacy and actually, when she does, go interact with some other people in the community rather than just be indoors all the time. Or it could be for the latchkey kid whose mom is working really hard, two jobs, to try to raise, single mom, trying to raise those kids. And that kid comes home from school and mom says what? What I want you to do is get inside and lock the door so I know you're safe. Because that's what we've fallen into. But what if, because of these trails, she says, you know, if you and two of your buddies want to walk down to the soccer field together at the community center, I'll let you do it. Because I know the trails are safe. You're off of the busy roads. You don't have to cross any busy streets. That's who Sarah stands for. All the people that benefit from having this done the right thing there in Plainfield, Indiana. 
I am a raving lunatic about this stuff, quite frankly, for none of you who, and don't take this personally, I don't care a whit about. Because you're big boys and girls and you can make your own decisions, and you should, adults should. I care about Sarah. I care about those two kids who happen to be mine. They're now 13 and 15. I've frozen them in time in three and five <laughs> because I like them better. No, because <laughs> they're wonderful kids. Bless their souls. They are great kids. They are also part of what may be the first generation to end up with statistically shorter life expectancies than their parents. Not because of Ebola or HIV AIDS or avian flu, not infectious disease. This generation, Sarah and my kids and your kids or grandkids, are going to be the first generation with shorter life expectancies than their parents because of the diseases of sedentary living and poor nutrition. That's unfathomable, unfathomable to me. Indeed, it is unconscionable that one generation could know it and do it to the next generation. Here's the good news. We know what we have to do for them. And it's not just tell them to exercise more and eat a good diet. We have to rebuild our communities so they can be free-range kids again, and their kids can be. And we know how to, and it's going to be hard and take courage and leadership. I challenge you to be the leaders who do that. It is an honor and a privilege to talk to you. I sincerely mean that for you to take the time to do this. I beg you to continue the good work you've already started. And, and I really can't thank the CPPW team enough for having me. It's really been a privilege. So thank you guys. Keep up the good work. Happy to chat with anybody that has the time. Thank you.